Hey, welcome back to The Dive. Today on the show, we have the CEO of Uranium Energy Corp, Admir Adnani. He's going to answer some of our questions about ESG investing and how it's changing the sentiment towards uranium, sanctions to Ross Adam and the impact it could have on the market, energy prices in Europe impacting demand for uranium, countries he could see adding significant nuclear power projects, retail investors having an impact on the spot price of uranium. He will also touch on the supply and demand imbalance in the market and give us an update on Uranium Energy Corp from their recent deal with the U.S. Department of Energy to their drill programs in Canada. And be sure to stick around to the end to hear about what to look forward to with Uranium Energy Corp this year. Hey, Amir, welcome back to The Dive. Thank you so much for joining us today. What incredible timing to be back. I mean, it was literally, I don't know how you planned this, but having this news out right now where Senators uh, John Barrasso and Joe Manchin have introduced bipartisan legislation to ban imports of Russian uranium into the U.S. This is incredible news and what timing to connect with you. Good to be back. Yeah, it's so great to have you back. Okay, so let's start off with this. Joe Biden is expected to issue his first presidential veto in an anti-ESG vote. What impact do you think the ESG narrative has on uranium, and how has this changed over the last year? I think this is really more about the green energy transition more than anything else. Governments, policies, and stated views to achieve net zero in the U.S. and the U.K., Japan, uh, and uh, various European Union countries are really looking at this energy transition movement, a transition to a lower carbon economy. An energy transition is now very much underpinned and it's accepted across uh, all models, all uh, climate scientists, anyone who's looked at this has come to the conclusion that we cannot achieve net zero, we cannot move towards a lower carbon economy without nuclear power playing a significant role. We are seeing the best fundamentals today for nuclear energy ever uh, in, in, in the weeks past, not even going back over the last year, but just in the weeks past, we've seen Japan do a pivot and policy towards nuclear energy. We've seen Italy come out. We've seen Belgium extend the life of reactors. We've seen Sweden come out. In the US, there's a very exciting emerging uh, sector with small and advanced modular reactors. And so whether you call it ESG, whether you call it sustainability, does, th th what does it all mean? It means ultimately that we need to move to a lower carbon economy. And a lower carbon economy is powered by nuclear energy. And we have bipartisan support for this, as I just mentioned at the get-go. The White House supports nuclear energy. It's one of the only topics today in Washington where Democrats and Republicans don't bicker about. It's incredible that we have, we're seeing this historic, unprecedented bipartisan support for nuclear power. Now, according to the Washington Post, Ross Adam has been working to supply Russia's military with components, technology, and raw materials for missiles. Do you think that any sanctions to Ross, Ross Adam's Adam actions would have an impact on the market? Absolutely. I mean, Rosatom is the largest supplier of uranium and nuclear fuel in the world, along with the material that they get out of Kazakhstan, which is 40% of global supply. This would have a profound impact on the uranium market. This would be the equivalence of having uh, all of OPEC all of a sudden be uh, having their supply be unavailable to the Western market. What would that do to the oil price? And so it would have the same profound impact in uranium. And this is exactly the issue with the Washington Post article that you refer to is highlighting is exactly the reason why we saw this, uh, the two senators that I mentioned, Senator Barroso and Manchin yesterday, introduced this legislation, this bipartisan legislation to ban Russian uranium imports. The ultimate trend that we're witnessing here is that ever since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Western countries and utilities are absolutely trying to move away from Russia and diversify away from Russia when they, uh, when it comes to any energy commodities. Too many energy commodity supply chains are linked back to Russia. And it's this delinking that is very much a trend. And it's a trend of national security. It's a trend of energy security. And it happens in the case of nuclear power to converge 
at the exact same time that we have the mega trends of decarbonization and electrification at play as well. It creates a perfect storm. And so again, uh, the I think the article is pointing to a catalyst that very much is at play now for the uranium price, and it could very well create upward pressure in uranium prices. How do you view energy prices in Europe impacting the demand for uranium? Just continue that uh, demand uh, for uranium and other energy commodities. At the end of the day, we've seen a crazy power price surge in Western Europe. Uh, if you uh, if you look at your energy bill and you live in Europe, if you live in Germany and you live in England, you're paying somewhere between as low as four times and as high as 10 times more on a monthly basis for your energy bill and energy costs. In some cases, you're paying more for power on a monthly basis to, to run your life as much as you're paying for rent or your mortgage. So the bottom line impact is real and it pivots the policy discussion around how to, how to address that. And one way you can address that is that instead of depending on the flows of natural gas or coal uh, or oil from Russia, it's to have that independence when it comes to energy by having nuclear reactors. Nuclear reactors consume far less of their primary fuel, uranium, to operate and generate electricity compared to gas-fired plants or coal-fired plants. And it's that incredible power density and propensity that nuclear power has that makes it so attractive. And so ultimately, I think much, much of what we're seeing in terms of favorable policy and endorsement and acceptance towards nuclear energy is driven by the issues that we're seeing in Western Europe as a result of uh, Russia really leveraging its energy to drive its geopolitical agenda, which in this case is war. And it's unacceptable. And it's unacceptable to anyone who uh, is looking at this in the West and says, we don't want to be a hostage to Russia's uh, foreign uh, hostilities and the uh, the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine is unacceptable. And if this means that we need to retool and rethink our energy mix to better address the shortcomings that we've had in, in the energy uh, platform in the West, then we have to do it. What countries do you think could add significant nuclear power projects over the next 10 years? United States with the advancements of small modular reactors, and globally, we're seeing a very exciting emerging opportunity with small modular reactors. In addition to that, uh, China is building a, the, a, very, uh, a, a very robust nuclear energy program where they have more reactors on the construction than any other country and are very badly trying to build reactors to deal with their pollution problems and the clean air objectives and initiatives they have in that country. But again, we're seeing the turnaround and attitude where countries like South Korea, Italy, Sweden, Japan even, who were previously on the fence about nuclear energy are now wanting to either restart existing reactors that were idled, extend the life of existing reactors that were expected to retire, or simply build new ones. How big of an impact do you think retail investors can have on the spot price of uranium? With the introduction of the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, investors have the ability now to express an investment in physical uranium directly by investing in the shares of the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. And when they do that, they have the uh, what they're basically doing is, in a way, enabling Sprott to purchase physical uranium in the market. Uh, Sprott is able to publish a daily net asset value of their holdings, which, if trading at a positive to NAV position allows them to buy uranium. And if at a discount, they simply hold. And so at no point are they a seller of uranium. And investing in their shares is a direct proxy now for exposure to physical uranium that's priced and marked on a day-to-day -day basis. When talking about uranium, we often hear of a serious supply and demand imbalance in the market. Do you think that this can only be fixed with higher prices? That's the only way this issue can be fixed. And higher commodity prices are the cure for supply deficits in general. It's a cyclical business. We have a supply gap today where primary production is about 100 and 
35 million pounds and demand on an annualized basis is approaching 200 million pounds. This gap uh, with the $50 uranium price that we have isn't being uh, filled. And so ultimately, higher prices are going to incentivize the development of a new generation of uranium mines. And that higher price, I believe, is going to be for the industry somewhere north of $70 to $80 per pound. We think a lot of the lower cost already built permitted projects, like those of what we have in Texas and Wyoming, can operate in a north of $60 per pound environment. But for the most part, to genuinely address the supply deficit, the structural deficit that the industry sees on a global basis for grass root projects and projects that are not built yet or permitted, we think the hurdle is certainly, again, north of $70 and even perhaps higher than that on a per pound basis. So definitely, I think the, the supply deficit issue is real. Definitely, it will be addressed, uh, but only when we see adequately higher sustained prices for a long time. Okay, now let's talk about uranium energy. You announced that you have received around $18 million from the U.S. Department of Energy for supplying 300,000 pounds of U.S. origin uranium concentrates. What can you tell us at this point? We were thrilled and very honored and proud to be able to provide the initial uranium to the U.S. government's newly formed Strategic Uranium Reserve. This is similar to the Strategic Petroleum Reserve that the U.S. government has. This is very unprecedented. Again, think about the idea that uranium, which is purchased and consumed for nu by nuclear power plants for electricity generation, now has a new customer in the form of the U.S. government. And the last time the U.S. government purchased uranium for its own account was the 1950s. So we're living through historical developments. This perhaps suggests that we are heading in a bifurcated market where because supplies could be cut off from Russia, and because Russia is such a large supplier of uranium, even the U.S. government sees the strategic benefit of having a uranium reserve that can provide fuel assurance and supply assurance in the event of disruptions. The uranium that they purchased had to come from U.S. companies and U.S. companies with U.S. production capabilities. So it also validates our thesis as a U.S. company with U.S. assets that longer term, there's a real premium to pay for U.S. mined uranium and U.S. origin uranium. In this case, the Department of Energy purchased a million pounds of uranium. We supplied and were awarded 300,000 pounds of that, and it was the largest award. And it was uh, priced at a 20% premium to the spot market. The spot market was about $50 per pound, and the awarded price was about $60 per pound. And so again, there, there's a validation in a way of the premium associated with U.S. supply, which confirms that there's a scarcity of U.S. supplies. U.S. currently has no production of uranium, and consumption is at 50 million pounds per year, making the U.S. the largest consumer of uranium for power generation. And finally, I think it's an incredible vote of confidence for our company to be awarded. It, it, it confirms and demonstrates that we've managed to go through the very rigorous process that the government had to qualify to be able to sell this material to them. And finally, this initial purchase by the U.S. government and Department of Energy is the first $60 million purchased in what is proposed to be a $1.5 billion program to stockpile physical uranium. And so if, as this program is really expanded and unfolds in the coming years, there's potential for this business and source of buying for our company to continue to grow in addition to the fact that we can sell uranium in the spot market to U.S. utilities and also to uh, global uh, players and consumers of uranium. And we really think that it's about uranium assets in politically safe jurisdictions. So not only are we now in the U.S., which has been our business for the last 18 years in Texas and Wyoming, but we've also expanded our business into Canada and Canada's Athabasca Basin in northern Saskatchewan. And we've made two acquisitions there over the last six months to really cement a leadership position there for us uh, after Cameco and Orano in that area, because we do believe that in a world that is looking for politically stable sources of uranium that can be reliable, 
Canada is equally reliable as the U.S. It may not qualify for sales to the U.S. government, the production we have there, but the Athabasca Basin is home to the highest grade uranium deposits in the world. And long term, this is also a very strategic place uh, to have uh, projects and, and, and a pipeline of development assets. So speaking of your project in Saskatchewan, we saw that you filed a technical report summary on EDGAR, disclosing updated mineral resources for your Horseshoe Raven project. Could you walk us through this? We made uh, two acquisitions in Canada last year. We acquired a company called UEX, and we, we acquired an asset called Rough Rider from Rio Tinto. UEX was a very exciting acquisition because that company came with roughly 30 uranium projects, five of which are in joint ventures with uh, strong partners like Cameco and Orano. But also a number of these projects are, have been previously explored and drilled, and hence we can establish resources very quickly. And that was the case with our Horseshoe Raven project. It was a great benefit of the acquisition that we made of UEX where that's just one of 30 uranium projects where we're able to establish a new resource estimate. And it's quite exciting. We have five more opportunities like that coming from that portfolio. Uh, we are also working on a resource estimate for our Rough Rider project that we acquired uh, from uh, Rio Tinto. This really gives us a portfolio in this Athabasca Basin where we have projects on the east side of the basin where there's existing infrastructure and on the west side of the basin where a number of companies are planning to build new mines and hence there'll be future infrastructure available for project development. So we feel like we have not only entered the Athabasca Basin with our two acquisitions, but we've entered it in a very complete way, given us exposure to various corners of the basin that have different value propositions. And we'll, we have the ability to release resource estimates like the Horseshoe Raven report that you alluded to, in the coming months, we look forward to releasing a resource report for the Rough Rider project. We're really excited about that. And then advance that project with an economic study. We're also drilling, and we have been drilling since uh, late last year, at our Christie Lake project. That's another very exciting opportunity. Here's a project, Christie Lake, that sits between the MacArthur River and Cigar Lake mines. These are the two largest uranium mines in the world. Some of the drilling results we announced recently uh, have intersected 15% uranium over seven meters. And this is on a project that's nine kilometers away from MacArthur River. Again, the world's largest uranium mine. And that's a project that already has a resource report, but we're hoping that with these uh, additional drill results, we can update that resource report by the end of the year. So we have, in addition to the news that you saw recently on Edgar, that you're Cedar that you mentioned too, we have a very active new school pipeline for the rest of this year from our Canadian portfolio with drilling results, updated resource estimates on multiple projects. And again, with the backdrop of geopolitical tension in the world, it is could not be a better time to be in mining-friendly, politically stable jurisdictions like Saskatchewan, Wyoming, and Texas. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, Amir. Is there anything else that you would like to highlight or like your investors to know before you leave us? Plenty of information at our website at uh, www.uraniumenergy.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at Amir Adnani. We tweet about and provide information on all things uranium all the time. And also all the project information on our investor deck, which is at uraniumenergy.com. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you so much. And we'll hopefully talk to you again soon. Thanks, Cassandra. To our audience at home, thank you so much for watching today. We will be back again tomorrow with another amazing interview, so be sure to stay tuned by hitting that notification bell and subscribing below before you leave us. Bye.